there's an Old Testament and there's a New Testament. And there are Old Testament prophets and there's New Testament prophets. And the old, the real Old Testament prophet was Leibniz, who in a completely visualized a digital universe. He saw that, he thought that binary arithmetic was at the, at the basic foundations of the entire universe and everything could be not only nature and the cosmos, but also human affairs. Everything could be digitally coded and become precise. We could answer all questions and speak a universal language. And he was, you know, 300 years ahead of his time. And not only that, he, he explained how to do it, how to build a digital machine that did not use wheels. It used, he said, use black and white marbles running down tracks. And then by shifting the tracks, you can perform all the functions of binary arithmetic. So he invented the shift register, which is what all microprocessors still run on today, except instead of a uh, gravity gradient, we use a voltage gradient and we use pulses of electrons. Uh, and then we took this tremendous step backwards for 200 years where we tried to do it with wheels, even though he said this would be better to do it without wheels. So we had people like Babbage, you know, who built this great analytic, it's a little piece of his analytical engine, and he worked with Ada Lovelace, who gets now a lot of credit, I think in some ways more credit than, than she actually may deserve, but for sort of the invention of software, the idea that with, uh, you can have one machine and you can write programs on cards and then you can convert the infinity of space which was required by the conditions of the problem. So you, you would have to build this enormous machine to do a problem. You just convert it to the infinity of time. You just do sequential steps programmed on cards. Now the problem is we don't have an infinity of time and that's where electronics comes in. So John Ambrose Fleming, who coined the word electronics, and he was a, uh, a fanatic creationist. He believed that, that Darwin was doing the work of the devil, and he actually formed an anti-evolution uh, anti society that still exists in England. So anyone who tells you that this prevailing view today, that you have to be an atheist to do good science, is total you know, jump on their iPhone. I mean, it, it, we would not have electronics without the work. He believed that, the, that sort of what he was doing with electronics was, was exposing the, you know, the mind of God. He had very clear ideas of sort of how quantum mechanics worked. But he, we always make progress when there's a problem. So there was a problem with the early light bulbs that they, they sort of, they sooted up inside but what he noticed was it was this asymmetry that the, uh, the light radiated symmetrically in all directions, but whatever these particles were, were radiating asymmetrically. And those particles, we, of course, we found out they were electrons, but they, they weren't named. They were actually named by a, a relative of the ancestor of Alan Turing. So they call this the Edison effect, but Edison couldn't find any way to make money on it, so he sort of put it aside. And, but then Fleming and then Lee de Forest, they started building what we now would say vacuum tubes. Fleming built a diode and de Forest puts this third electrode in there that he calls the grid. It's shaped like a grid for toasting toast in the fire. And so he invents the triode, which then later becomes uh, the transistor. So suddenly we have machines that can operate at the speed of light. They're limited by the speed of light, not the speed of sound. And, and all hell breaks loose. So the, Second, so now we've already come to the New Testament, and the, the, my view, the sort of defining prophet of the New, there were a number of prophets, but the, the guy who opened the door was Alan Turing, who really brought us into the digital world. So he was a very bright young child. So these, I'm going to name five prophets. People would argue maybe there should be six, maybe, you know, why do I have five? But Alan Turing, they all had fundamental questions. Who wondered whether machines can think. That was his big uh, question. Johnny von Neumann, who sort of took, Alan Turing gave us this very abstract one-dimensional model of computing where you just use a tape that, that can be moved back and forth. Von Neumann made that two-dimensional so it actually became a, a more practical thing. And his question was whether machines could reproduce, could reproduce themselves. That's actually a, sort of a more dangerous question than, you gotta be more worried about self-reproducing machines than intelligent machines. And Claude Shannon, who, question was, you know, 
how machines would communicate and whether machines could communicate to an arbitrary degree of accuracy against a, an arbitrary amount of noise, and he proved that the answer was yes. And nothing in computing would work without that uh, sort of Shannon error correction, because basically your computer is just a communication device communicating these states from one you know, clock cycle to the next. Norbert Wiener, who actually was, was almost sort of had one foot in the Old Testament, there is, he is in World War I, always getting in, in trouble, uh, had, couldn't get a job, was living in a basement writing encyclopedia articles when, when Oswald Veblen rescued him. And his question was when machines, not if, but when they would and how they would take control. So that was what cybernetics was all about. And now the fifth prophet, who's basically unknown, but should be much better known, Lewis Fry Richardson, who in World War I worked on numerical weather prediction, taking the entire globe, dividing it up into cells, and then solving the hydrodynamic equations between cells, and calculated that if you had, you would need, it was an interesting number he came up with, he said you would need 64,000 human mathematicians doing these calculations, and then you could actually do the weather uh, faster than the weather itself, and you could start making predictions. So his question was how and if machines could do predictions. And everything you need to know about the real future of AI is on this slide. This is 1930, Lewis R. Richardson, it's an electrical model illustrating a mind having a will but capable of only two ideas. So it's a, which is where this talk is going to go, it's a, it's a non-deterministic uh, digital, so it's a digital circuit that, that falls into one of two states, but it has free will. You cannot predict what state it will be in, but once it, once it you know, becomes Republican or Democrat, it stays that way, but you can't, you can't predict which. And so you can easily imagine building machines out of those units instead of deterministic transistors, and then you get very interesting uh, behavior. The thing about... Uh, what are the P and Q in those? Those are sources of quantum noise, so they are non-deterministic. Uh, they just read sort of quantum noise out of the quantum fluctuations in the universe, so, uh, and then it falls into one or the other state. But Richardson was a Quaker and a severe pacifist, so when, whenever anybody say, oh, Dr. Richardson, you know, we, the military would be interested in this, then he would stop working on it. So he completely stopped working on AI and went back to, and he stopped working on, on meteorology because he, the military, of course, was interested in, in predicting weather for, for battles. So in the end, he, he worked on the distribution of wars in time and uh, trying to predict conflict. So Alan Turing, at age 23, he starts writing this paper, the most, probably most cited paper in computer science, that that's actually a copy that, that belonged to von Neumann. But nobody was interested. He, he, write, he, he, came, he was actually in America when this was published. He was in New Jersey. And he writes to his mother, very unhappy. Only two people asked for reprints of the paper. Um, but that, that's the copy that belonged to the engineers. So you see the engineers have just almost destroyed it, reading it over and over again. Because von Neumann oh. was very clear that, that he wanted you know, to actually build this Turing's machine, the computer. The, what we now, of course, know is a, a universal Turing machine that can do anything. So in World War II, suddenly those ideas had uh, real import. So this is a machine, one of the first computers to actually use vacuum tubes, uh, running very fast to try and break the German, the di German digital code. So you- and By the way, the women there, the, those are coders. Yes, yeah, the, the, all of, most of the women were or most of the coders were women, and they're usually unnamed. I went to, it's not very easy to find their names because they, they often change their names, they weren't recorded. So they were working with, uh, with Alan Turing, who the, the, who the film completely misrepresented. They made him sort of asocial, and, and I've talked to some of these women, and they, they all loved Alan Turing. He was very sociable and uh, friendly and had a great sense of humor. Uh, and there's von Neumann with his, so he's taking Turing's machine and, and giving it a two-dimensional memory. There's a kilobit of memory in each of those tubes. We'll get to that a little later. So, so he's got 20 kilobits on this side and 20 kilobits on the other side. It's a V40 engine. 
<laughs> and that he didn't build, but he knew how to find the, the right people to build it. So von Neumann, he, he just took the ideas of other people. There's no, there's, it's absolutely, there's lots of smoking guns that he, he, he took other people's ideas, but he knew how to find the people to do it, and he, you know, he had the mathematical genius to, to see the problems that needed to be solved. The real secret was his father was an investment banker, so he was, he just felt completely entitled and was not at all shy about asking for money. So he could get money where other people couldn't. And then, he, of course, the Nazis drove him out of Europe, so he came to America and loved the military. So it was just the right person in the right place at the right time with the right ideas to sort of make Turing's thing real. And there he is. That's, that's Princeton in the 1930s. Everybody in that picture is Hungarian except H.P. Uh, Robertson, who was from Hokium, Washington, right out near Aberdeen. And he was teaching physics to Alan Turing. So the whole thing is connected. They were all there together at the same uh, parties. And then they all ended up at Los Alamos, where there was a, a big computing problem. So you've got von Neumann, Richard Feynman, Stan Ulam, who we would not have von Neumann without Ulam. Ulam was sort of the, the back, the guy who gave von Neumann all his best ideas, and, and von Neumann bounced everything off of, and, and Dick Feynman, who was the guy who, when they ordered one of every computing machine that IBM made, but they came in boxes, and you weren't allowed to open them until the IBM technicians showed up, but Feynman just came in and tore open the crates and got it all working. So he, he put a lot of that together. And Nick Metropolis, the other sort of missing link, who gave us the Metropolis algorithm for Monte Carlo. So we wouldn't have had Monte Carlo without, without Nick, and Nick worked with Clary von Neumann on, on all those early code. So that's the ENIAC was our American machine, again, with the coding being done by women. So in England, they had built 10 of the Colossus machines. We just had one ENIAC built at the uh, University of Pennsylvania for the Army. And Clary, who was the, the Hungarian national figure skating champion, who married von Neumann, they met they met in Monte Carlo at the casino. She was married to a compulsive gambler, and Johnny thought he had a system to beat uh, roulette and, and failed and lost all his money, and she bought him a drink, and they, they had remembered each other from school, and they fell back in love. They both divorced their spouses and, and lived you know, reasonably happy ever after until von Neumann died. But she, so she became the person who, he wanted someone to program the machine before the machine was even ready. She needed a guinea pig, so it says, I became one of the first coders, and new occupation was quite widespread today. She's saying this in 1961. So they worked on these early Monte Carlo codes, which everyone knows, why did they name it Monte Carlo? And I think they named it after Monte Carlo. Um, and she was the perfect person because her job, during the war, everybody left to Los Angeles. She was left alone in Princeton and wanted to work, she got a job at the Office of Population Research at the university, doing, running models of populations, what would happen to Europe if you know, all the Jews were killed in various scenarios. And so she was working on modeling populations, which is exactly what Monte Carlo does. It takes census, except you're modeling neutron uh, reproduction, and you know, if, if, if you put a tamper on, then the, the, the generations don't reproduce, and that's, that's what these codes did. And they ran for very, so a Monte Carlo code like that on a bomb would, so that, that is the, there was no operating system or anything. This is what we would call now the source code or the flowchart for a, a hydrogen bomb problem that Clary is going to run, and it will take, it will run for six weeks to effectively get a one-bit answer, will it work or not. And the Conventional view is that the women who did this coding, well, they just did the arithmetic and the guys did the physics. That's the way it's always been assumed. But if you read Clary's private letters, which were in a filing cabinet next to the water heater and did not go into any archives, they're full of revealing, should have been classified stuff, because she's writing back and forth to the guys in Los Alamos, because she's back there running the machine. You, if, so if you read what she says, it's clear she has to understand the physics in order to sort of babysit this problem. She has to know 
what, how it corresponds to the physics of the explosion itself. So an explosion that in real life will take microseconds, you know, being run in this artificial world for weeks and weeks and weeks. And, and all this involves, you know, in this case, half a million cards being punched and sort of cycled through. So how this got distributed was she and Johnny, they loved to drive. They went back, you know, across the country 28 times. With, that's with no seat belts, no FM radio, no air conditioning, um, you know, manual transmission. But they stopped everywhere. So everywhere they went, they were sort of spreading this gospel of coding and digital computing. And of course, she had security clearance, which, which now would be hard for a, you know, for a Hungarian. And, but they wanted their own machine. They were, doing, they were still doing this on the ENIAC and a few other really poor machines, but they imagined a fully programmable, you know, sort of modern stored program machine. And the guy who helped them was Oswald Veblen, who had run the proving ground, which was the, sort of the predecessor of Los Alamos in World War I, and understood, he was a pure mathematician, but he understood uh, what they were trying to do. He would, it was his idea to start this Institute for Advanced Study, which was supposed to do no theoretical work, or no practical work and have no laboratories. But the motto was the usefulness of useless knowledge. Just let people work on useless things and they'll come up with something. And it was home to most famously, Veblen was the first professor, Einstein was second, Kurt Gödel didn't, didn't become professor until 1953. They kept him on a very low salary, just sort of as an adjunct. But he, you know, but he was so brilliant. And I, I personally believe a lot of his ideas filtered into, if you look at the way the von Neumann computer is structured with manipulating the addresses that manipulate the underlying words of code, that was, in many ways, it was Gödel's idea. That's how he did his proofs in logic, was the idea of giving logical statements, numerical addresses, manipulate the addresses, and then, uh, and he also, his, the problem he worked on until he died was the continuum hypothesis, and I think that uh, has profound implications for computing. The sort of, if, uh, any message in this whole talk, it's that the origins of computing come from this pure sort of Leibniz abstract world of logic, and it produced all these practical you know, the greatest wealth in the world and so on, but there's still so many untouched ideas in, in the depths of foundations of mathematics that also have implications. We see that a lot in, in cryptography and... What is the continuum hypothesis? Continuum hypothesis is great. We have a slide for that. It's basically the, the idea, the question of infinity, that there, there actually are an infinite number of different infinities. But the strange thing, and whenever you, something strange happens, like the, the soot in the lamp, what's going on? What, what Gödel worked on is the continuum hypothesis proposes that there are only two kinds of infinity. Every single infinity is either on one side of the room or the other. It's like t-shirts at the end of a conference. They, they're only extra large or extra small. There's nothing in between. So the continuum hypothesis says that you, you will never find a medium-sized infinity, that they either are, uh, they belong to the continuum, so they're like analog machines. So like if you take a, a length of string, it has an infinite number of points on it, but if you cut that string in half, the half still has an infinite number of points. And if you cut that in half, it's still, it's always this continuous large infinity. But then the, so those are the uncountable infinities. And then the countable infinities are the digital world we live in, where everything is precisely countable. But no matter how, you can always add one and, and make it bigger, but it still stays a countable infinity. And the, so the hypothesis is that, but it's never been proved. It's been sort of half proved. And what I think is interesting is that when you look at the, the digital universe, that, in a strange way, is sort of an existence proof it's like a medium-sized infinity. It's this infinitely large, countable infinity. It's like we're trying to build one. We can't prove whether it's possible or not. But anyway, so I, th I think there's something. So in computing, that divides into the discrete state machines and the continuous so analog computing versus digital. And they are different. You know, any analog computer has the sort of power of a continuum. So they're back to the, what they were trying to do. They were trying to get started building this machine. <laughs> But the only, and this was right after the war, where the lumber was rationed, there was no free office, spare offices. The institute was completely full. They were actually, they, some of the political people from Geneva 
uh, for the United Nations were moving in to the third floor, so there was no space. The only space was, uh, it was a, Gödel had a secretary's office, 211, but he didn't have a secretary. He, he wrote everything himself. He didn't trust anyone to get his ideas perfectly right. So that was the only empty room, and that's where they, of course, hired a woman, uh, Acrovo Condorpio Emanuelides, who only died uh, last year. So she was 16 when she was hired. So she was one of the best people I talked to because she was younger than anybody else and had the, the four best years of her life working on this project. They put her in that little room and she typed basically the, the you know, commandments of, of digital computing. And, and she explained to me all the, how hard it was to get this type justified. You'd get one letter wrong, you'd have, you know, had nothing, everything that was done by hand. And she didn't get a computer until the 1990s, her daughter gave her a Mac. Uh, and then as, as project manager, nothing happens without a manager, was Bernetta Miller. She was the fifth woman in the United States to get a pilot's license. Uh, wanted to fly in World War One, wasn't allowed to. And then her eyesight went bad, and she got the job uh, managing the project, including the budget. So the first five months, they've been running from November to May. They won't, they've spent less than $10,000. You know, completely going to change the world, and this is the first four dollars for electrical work. So that's the that's the bill for the you know it was for putting an outlet in the wall so they could plug in their soldering guns and start uh, building things. So I, you know, I constantly asked, where do these great ideas come from, and 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 you know, don't we need a huge big project? You don't. I mean, it's a small. This was a group of about six engineers. The, the reason they were so revolutionary was that they were not working for IBM or RCA. They were completely, in, nobody was telling them, oh, this is how you do this. They just could reinvent it. So as lead engineer, von Neumann, he went to Norbert Wiener and said, who should I hire? Uh, the answer was Julian Bigelow, who showed up in a near, sort of dying Austin. Julian had his own airplane. He built, built his own machines. He was a real engineer. He fixed people's cars. Uh, Yet he also had this deep sense of computing. He worked on anti-aircraft control in World War. So that's the whole group. You can see it's at least half women. They brought in Vladimir Zvorkin, who was also Russian. So if, you, if you're counting countries, there's people from about 20 different countries who you know, now would have not got their visas. But uh, Zvorkin sort of brought television to America, which you know, is still argued about, but he was a Real, he, he ran the electronics labs for RCA. And he was trying to build a, this is like the dinosaur with feathers. It's a, it's a vacuum tube that is a 4,000 bit discrete state memory. So it's basically a USB stick built out of a vacuum tube. And it's, it's actually the reason we have USB sticks because the whole architecture of the machine was built to have this plug-in 4K memory. And that's the reason we still have an architecture where you can plug in your memory stick. It's still, of course, they had a very hard time getting that to work. They're doing this all with analog, sort of, they're, they're taking analog equipment that's lying around after World War II and building, you know, a perfectly digital machine out of it. Th things we take completely for granted, like an AND OR gate. Somebody had to take a piece of paper and say, this is an AND OR gate. That's the first, or actually it's the seventh designed for a shift register. So that's Leibniz's idea with the marbles done in vacuum tubes. And everything had to be replicated. They used a lot of high school students to do the actual construction, and also uh, women were doing a lot of it. That's the first prototype shift register. So the pulse, and it's, it's fail safe. So if you have a string of bits in one of these registers, it goes up into a temporary register, and only when it's confirmed that it's correct, then it comes down. Uh, you know, that's the Shannon thing of sort of error correction at every step of the way. Getting a 40-stage shift register to work was very hard. That, those modules with the vacuum tubes? Yes. In college, there was a bunch of 650s at IBM that sort of given to Rensselaer, and I tried to get one of them working. The, the key was not to turn the power off. Yeah, because so fight with the most custodians every day. Right, they fail more when they're turned off and on. Well, when they turn back on again, but just like that. And and Bigelow's 
and actually von Neumann's edict was, you know, use off-the-shelf components. And Julian Bigelow, who had worked on the reliability of munitions in the war, you know, if you've got a million bullets, how do you know that the next or, and our aircraft shells, how do you know the next one's going to be good? You can't test them all. But the more you make, the more reliable they are. So they used the 6J6, was the cheapest, most common tube. It wasn't special for computing. It was just what was in every drugstore radio. But they were the most reliable. And of course, the manufacturers competed, so price was very low. It was a twin triode, so it was essentially two triodes within a single envelope. So it, it, one 6J6 could store one bit. Very reliable. And then, but the selectrons, that fancy USB type memory never showed up. RCA just couldn't get it working in time. They had to get the machine. The reason for this machine was to solve hydrogen bomb problems, so it was, it was severe pressure. Um, they had uncovered a Russian mole at Los Alamos. So they knew that the Russians had all the American H-bomb designs already, and they, uh, so the pressure was on. So what they did was they took a... Uh, Five-inch oscilloscope tube. That's just this off-the-shelf, like what would Tektronics would use in Portland, uh, cathode ray tube, and then very cleverly worked on the principle that if you can remember like a black and white television, when you turn it off, even like a minute or two later, there's still static on the face. The glass is asking as a as a capacitor. So they built timing circuits that are displaying this array. So it's two to the fifth. It's it's 30, 32 by 32 bit of spots, and it remembers this. It goes back and refreshes the spots, and you can actually target a spot and tell whether it's a zero or a one. It was a, just a work of crazy genius to get that to work. So they get a kilobit in one tube. It's, effectively, it's the touch screen in reverse. Sort of what, what gives us the touch screen was their biggest problem. That if someone touched the screen, you lost all your data. So there you, you see how they've got you know, five kilobytes, because there's 40 tubes, 20 on each side. And this is Norman Phillips, who, who died uh, two months ago. His daughter wrote to me, because I, you know, I interviewed all these people, and they're slowly, he's one of the last. To how, how was the, uh, the cathode ray tube read? How did that? It's a, it's a bizarrely just, it, like, to explain something, you really have to understand it. That was the hardest thing I ever had to explain when I wrote a book about this. But the, the best way to explain it is that your So you're, you're basically, you're going around with a garden hose. You imagine we've got beer glasses on the table, and they can either be, they can either be full of beer or half empty. They can't be completely empty. And so, but, so you can go around and fill a beer glass, and and then, but how do you how can you read it if you have a hose, and target one beer glass, you get a different splash, you get a different amount of beer spilling out depending on whether it was full or half empty, and that splash, they, if you noticed on this, in that picture, it was a little wire screen over the face, and so when you target one spot from the back. You get a little splash of electrons. And I, this was a brief slide, so I don't think it's in here, but, it, but I have slides of the, the different waveforms versus whether, whether it was a, you know, a full glass or a half empty glass. So they're reading it through measuring electricity on the far side of the glass. Yeah, and they're doing all that processing right. They had an amplifier right in the face of the tube because if you, if you sent it even 20 feet over a cable, it would get lost in the noise. It was a, I think it was a 30. 30 trillion gain amplification or something. Just amazing that they could, and, 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 and a huge struggle. I mean, half the logbooks of the engineers are filled with memory struggles um, trying to, that's another slideshow, but just, you know, trying to make that distinction. You had, uh, they would read every 24 microseconds. So you had microse you know, microseconds to make this distinction was it sort of which kind of splash it was. It's amazing they got it to work. And so, of course, they're working on these bomb problems they weren't supposed to talk about. So sort of to, to hedge his bets, von Neumann really admitted, I mean, they all knew they were sort of doing the work of the devil building this machine. I mean, they, were trying, they were trying to build weapons whose only conceivable use is for killing large numbers of civilians. So to sort of, 
you know, redeem himself when I mean, worked on evolution. Could you use this machine? Could you create sort of digital life within this artificial digital universe? Brought in Nils Baricelli. I mean, I had a knack for, for just finding the right person with the right problem, and then he'd say, well, you can come use the machine. The Baricelli, who had, took him two years to get his visa, because he was, you see by his name, he was Italian-Norwegian, and the Italians said he was Norwegian, and the Norwegians said he was Italian, and neither of them would give him a visa. He finally sorted it. Took two years of writing back and forth to sort that out. But he's the first person to say, explicitly say that this was an artificially created universe. And so he took, he actually used playing cards draw, shuffle, out of a shuffle deck to sort of seed the memory with these random numbers and then write rules so they could, uh, you know, reproduce. He invented sex and all the other sort of forms of genetic uh, combination to get evolutionary systems going. He realized that you had to have diversity, so these are different universes that could that the organisms could sort of propagate back and forth through. And then his last paper he wrote before he died. So he was he, one hand he was totally crazy, but he was totally right. And what what's it's when I went back to this institute to years ago to find the room, you know, where was this room in the basement where they first started working on the machine after they left Google's office? They, they got a room next to the laboratory in the, next between the boiler room and the laboratory in the basement. And that room now is the server room for the, and in there, and I, the, you know, the administrator gave me the tour, he showed, you know, this machine is a firewall machine. So it, they have a dedicated machine. All it's trying to do is keep out the things that Baricelli was trying to evolve. I mean, he was, so everything he, he sort of predicted became trendy. And then as Julian said, he was really the person who really understand the true path to AI was evolutionary systems. So a huge tragedy. It's equivalent to, you know, Alan Turing died at age 41. Von Neumann dies at age 54. And they turn the machine off. That's the last entry in the logbook. Oh. Julian H. Bigelow, Midnight Hot. The Oppenheimer wanted nothing to do with it. I mean, von Neumann and Bigelow had these dreams of a starting a, you know, a school of computer science. They had plans for a second generation machine. It had a keyboard that you could type directly in hexadecimal. It had all these advanced features. And Oppenheimer, bastard, he killed the whole project and, and tried to fire Julian Bigelow, who wouldn't leave. And then when I went back trying to you know, Oppenheimer wanted all the material destroyed, but that always stuff gets saved by accident. So in one basement was a bunch of boxes, including this box that has one of Baricelli's universes in it. And a note from the engineer said, you know, Mr. Baricelli, there must be something about this code that you haven't explained yet. And what I didn't say, beginning introducing Alan Turing, that Alan Turing was brought into this because he was trying to disprove something called the Entscheidungs problem, which is a deep, one of these deep logical questions, whether by looking at any string of symbols, is there any systematic way to tell whether it's a provable formula or not? That's equivalent to the question in modern computers. Is there any systematic way of looking at a string of code to tell what that code will do? Is it good or bad? You can't. So you know, Turing proved that you can't do it. So the, what the engineers said is very, you know, it's, it's absolutely true. And what we forget was that um, Alan Turing is, of course, remembered for the Turing machine. But even by the time by the time he came to America in 1936, he was he had lost interest in deterministic machines. He was interested in non-deterministic machines. So he worked on his thesis with Alonzo Church, uh, systems of logic based on ordinals. And what he called these were oracle machines. So they were machines that behaved logically for a certain number of steps, but then they did something completely illogical. He thought that would be much more interesting. And, uh, and so when he was a consultant on Ferrante, the first commercial machine made in England, he insisted there had to be a source, a sort of Richardson-style source of quantum noise on the main motherboard of the computer. It had to be able to take a completely random guess. Of course, he was a crypto guy, so he knew how important that was. And Intel, I think, only did that in 2013. We finally got a hardware-based random number generator. And the same with von Neumann. He's remembered for this von Neumann architecture but he would be horrified if he came back today and found that we all were still using that crappy architecture. It was just, it was designed to solve this one problem, not to keep going. 
Now, if you look at von Neumann, he, he only has one patent. That whole von Neumann orchestra was sort of given to the world for nothing. It was never patented, which, which irritated the engineers. But von Neumann has one single patent, and it's for a non-von Neumann computer. It's for what you would now call a neuromorphic processor that works like a you know, hardware-based neural network. So he became obsessed with you know, how the brain works, which is not digital, it's completely analog. And in my view, there are three, like there's five prophets, there's three laws of AI. There's Ashby's law of requisite variety. That any effective control system has to be as complex as the system it's controlling. This is my name for von Neumann's law of sufficient complexity. And a complex system, by definition, constitutes its own simplest behavioral description. And if you try and uh, describe a complex system in any formal way, for instance, with an algorithm, it becomes absurdly more complicated. And that's fundamental. That's, um, it used to be very hard to explain this. Now you can explain it with one word. You just have to say Boeing, and people get it. That, you know, that they were trying to model you know, a complicated analog system in, completely in software, and it's very hard to do. And then the third law, which is my law, is that any system complicated enough to behave intelligently will be too complicated to understand. <laughs> and people used to take comfort and say, well, we don't have to worry about AI because you know, we, can't, it, we don't understand the human brain. How are we, gonna, well, are we ever going to have superhuman intelligence? But there's an enormous loophole in this law. Of course, now we all know what that loophole is. It's, we call it machine learning. That you, it's quite possible to design, to build something that you don't understand. And, and of course, this also was done very early. It was in the 1950s in England. Oliver Selfridge, another one of the prophets, developed a system called Pandemonium, great name, which essentially is, is machine learning. It's a, it's a way of you know, doing pattern recognition where you don't need to define the problem in advance, or finding cats on the internet with, with decision layers and demons, and also adding the sort of Baricelli idea that you then uh, you sort of allow virtual machines to reproduce and the, and the successful ones are replicated. So Alan Turing couldn't talk about what he really did in World War II. It was secret, but his closest colleague was Jack Good, and Jack Good lived a long life and did talk about it. So this, this Jack Good's book, on, this is a book on Bayesian probability. It effectively tells you what they did in the war, but it never mentions it. But if you read that book, it's, it's sort of a roadmap to how they really broke those extremely, uh, almost unbreakable German codes. And Jack Good also worked on, wrote a lot about, about real AI, ultra-intelligent ultra machines, which he defines, that's a machine that believes people cannot think. And He understood, which also came from Turing, that the only way you're going to get such a machine is to build a very large random network because then it will contain any possible, that's how we make intelligent people. We start with a baby that has all this random networks and sort of prune out the, the stuff that's not needed. He also wrote about ethical machines, which I think I kind of believe that, that people are not that ethical. It's quite possible machines could be more ethical than, than people. We don't. We don't know, so the jury's out, but this is a very good roadmap of how to build ethical machines. And then he asked Turing, you know, this question, what would it take for a machine to be conscious? And Turing answered, he'd say so if he would otherwise be punished. That's a very Turing answer. So the last words are going to go to Ulam, and who worked with von Neumann. They were working, tragically, when von Neumann died, he and Ulam were collaborating on a grand book about intelligence in natural and artificial systems. This is just their outline. Then, then Ulam never finished it. But it starts with Wiener, Turing, not Turing. That's what you, you know, Turing, everything you can do with a Turing machine, not Turing things you can't. Pitts McCulloch, that's neural networks. And then Ulam, which is sort of cellular automata. So there's Stan. He, he sort of, one of his colleagues told me he was at simultaneously the most intelligent and laziest person he had ever known. And so there he is winning. He's winning at poker at Los Alamos. The guys he's playing against, they're no slouches. I mean, there's Nick Metropolis, and, um, Stan Cowan, uh, uh, C.J. Everett. So th these are great, um, Carson Mark. These are good mathematicians, but he's still beating them all at poker. And so Ulam said, you know, what makes you so sure that mathematical logic corresponds to the way we think? If you take apart the brain, which is what 
point nine million. You don't find any digital code. There's no algorithms. There's no. Those are much higher level things. The brains work in a completely sort of analog, non-deterministic way. So you're back, and that's what I believe is happening today. We're, we're going through the next cycle of the revolution, just the way after World War II we had all this analog equipment. And we put it together to make digital machines, and now we're doing the exact opposite of that. We're taking all this, um, you know, unfathomable wealth of digital equipment, but we're back to building analog computers. We're building machines that, that compute with continuous functions by relative pulse frequency, all those things that uh, sort of are the way nervous systems work, and we're doing it sort of large scale on the internet as a whole. So there's so analog, I believe, is coming back. In two ways, it's, it's top down with these very large systems that are sort of pulse frequency coded. Then bottom up, there are a number of companies, very interestingly, working on building analog chips directly in silicon. So chips that smell, chips that do speech recognition right in your phone, and so on. Where where they're not modeling. Most neural networks now are modeled on digital, you know, von machines. But there's no reason you can't actually build them from the bottom up in silicon. And that will be as big a game, chamber as, game changer as the first you know, four-bit microprocessor. It's every, I think in 20 years, everything is going to be changed by those chips. But remember what Leibniz said was, you know, even though you can make a lot of money at it, it's, it really is something more profound. There's a sort of deeper mathematical truth here. It's not just made for selling oils and sardines. And then the tragedies of all the people, which is what I've tried to do in my career as a writer, is tell these stories and tell the stories of the people who did not get enough credit, like Julian Bigelow and, of course, Clary von Neumann, who was relatively unknown until she, she was sort of the person who saved my last book, I mean, the character who brought it to life. And, and likewise, like Alan Turing, who we don't know committed suicide, but maybe, probably, Clary was definitely a suicide. After von Neumann died, she got married one more time and then swam out into the ocean in La Jolla. And my own mother, who came from that generation, knew Clary and was a <clears throat> mathematician, a logician, so she worked with Gödel. And, and so the good thing about computing was that it, it saved all these people. I mean, my mother came to America, and when she left my dad, she, she couldn't get a job. The only job, she, she got a job at Remington Rand, working on the traveling salesman problem, which had military implications. And then she got a job at, at Hughes Aircraft working on automatous theory. So that was one of the only ways a someone doing pure logic, and I mean that saved kind of saved me. That's why I'm here because she she was working as a you know lecturer in a college in New York teaching calculus to freshmen, and then she got this job, bought a you know bought a new car and drove out to Los Angeles and, and you know everything changed. And so the computer industry has been great for a lot of people but needs to work harder at giving you know credit to the people who did all the work in the first place. And I have to thank all the people who let me into these archives. I dropped out of high school, 16. If I wanted to do physics or something, there would be no chance. But I decided to do history, all these archives were open. It's one of the few disciplines that's open to and welcomes people without credentials, and uh, including that institute who now, you know, are very happy with sort of the stories I've told. They've given me a sort of lifetime partition on their, on their servers, so I have this email address. But if you send me a, a one-sentence email with no attachments, it will take up ten times the memory that they had for doing all that work in the first place. Because, you know, they did all that stuff they did, all those problems they they did it in five kilobytes of memory. That's all they had at that time. So it's easy to remember. In 1953, there were 53 kilobytes of high-speed memory on the entire planet, and that's how. Kind of, and I think I think in our gift bag is a gigabyte, right? Um, or at least in mine. So uh, we're <laughs> making progress. Good. So we probably have, we have 10 minutes, five, 10 minutes till the next questions. All right. So with that. 5K computer with the primitive technology, how do they enter programs and data, and how do they read out the answers? They, okay, at first, purely manually, um, they used, well, again, they used what was the ubiquitous technology then, was tele, teletype tape, which was 
five hole punch tape. So they had, again, all that stuff was still there, the manual and stuff. So they just read directly. They would punch the program. One of the women would punch the program on five bit tape and then they would read that in very slowly. Then they evolved to faster and faster input later. And the original output was also output on tape, but very quickly they made it. You know, at that time, we hard to remember, IBM did not allow you to modify IBM equipment. You, you, would, you could go to jail for messing with an IBM machine, but they made a deal with IBM where IBM allowed them to modify IBM equipment if IBM had the rights to anything they did. So it was very good for IBM. So they started taking the IBM punch card machines that were like running at Los Alamos on the 650s and machines like that, the 029 punches, and interfacing that in. So their structure was they had 40-bit words, and they could, so they used 80-column cards and could. 029 was a modern machine. Could, yeah, so they. In the, in the 60s? It was all, like when you see those, those beautiful drawing, those printouts of Baricelli's universes um, that are kind of blue and white, those are actually punch cards. So he would output it as, as a whole array of cards, and then he, he laid them down on paper, on uh, blueprint paper, and then exposed it to sunlight, and then would take it and get it developed. And that's, that's how you got those beautiful, those images of, uh, so nothing would happen without punch cards. Uh, in what sense are modern computers still using a von Neumann architecture? And like, what would it look like if we didn't? Uh, well, we do, we still using this, I mean, there's sort of varying definitions of what von Neumann architecture is. One, one definition is it's simply the distinction between central processor, memory, input-output as separate systems, and then the von Neumann bottleneck is the bottleneck used to be going back and forth to memory. A lot of those bottlenecks have, have, have got better and better. Uh, but more it's the, just the architecture of using this two-dimensional memory space where everything, a modern computer now, of course, GPUs and so on are starting to move into a different realm, but the classical computing just just has an address space and goes to one address, executes one instruction, puts the result in another address, goes to the next instruction, goes to so 99.99% of the computer is doing nothing, 99% of the time is just waiting for that next instruction. There's no reason which what Bigelow wanted to do, build machines that that are doing other stuff all the time. Um, so that's fundamentally the, the idea that, that, which we sort of take for granted now, that, that a machine only does, you know, that it works in cycles. It just does one instruction at a time. The, that Princeton machine actually didn't have a clock speed. It was asynchronous. So it could, it could run at any speed. And, and so when it wasn't working right, they could just step through the instructions one by one, look at what was happening. Yes? Yeah. And you can use it to solve a differential equation. And it's extremely powerful. Yeah. It can do things. I mean, it's amazing how, the, again, you can build this complexity that you can't do with a digital would be very hard. There was a great study came out recently about um, one of the companies in England that had, a, had an analog computer just for sort of process control. And, and, and it's doing amazingly complicated. And, it, and the thing was still running until recently. So I think, anyway, that's my sort of opinion that analog is, is very effective for, for things and it's going to be coming back. It's much more robust. Uh, so, yeah. So is all this a precursor to another book? Uh, not really. I mean, I, I have a few years ago and sort of showed the early stuff you were doing for the cathedral. But yeah, that, that, that very clearly became, this story became this book, Turing's Cathedral. My new, my new book is a very strange mix of stuff. It has quite a bit about analog computing. That's part of the story, but it's mixed with, with a lot of other strange things. So, so it's, not, it's not as clear. The problem with books is that people expect you to do the same thing again. It's like if you do music, they want, well, just like your last album, but different. So I did these two books on big, deep projects, and then people expect, oh, you're going to do another book on another big project. But I, those were the only, this computer project and the Orion Space Project, which are the only big projects I really felt just this personal, you know, I want to tell that story and talk to the people while they're still alive, which is just barely in time. It's a, What's the title of your new book? new book is called Analogia. 
but it's it's long. It's a year. It's at least a year from coming out, and it and it. So, so you see analog coming in possibly in the next ten twenty years, but how is quantum computing? So that's always a question. Quantum computing. I know nothing about quantum computing. I'm a skeptic. I don't see how it's going to be useful, but but people are enormous amounts of money being put into it, and so there. You know, if you ask my prediction, and I don't believe in predictions, and, and people are always proven wrong, you know, oh, well, digital computing will never work. It, the, how are you going to deal with the error correction? You know, it's not going to work. And it did. So what, but that's my view of quantum computing, that I don't see quantum computers ever doing much except government cryptography that, that can't be done better with just at the rate. And, but what I do think is going to change the game are these super cheap direct analog chips that just do dedicated things, I mean, which is driven by the, you know, it's driven by cell phones, drones, and self-driving cars where you just, you know, you, you need the brain of a fruit fly. Um, and we still don't know how to do that with, with full digital systems without drawing an enormous amount of power. So. Do you have uh, Yeah, the ones I saw, I, and all I know about this was from going to a meeting at Intel, this field is changing super fast. So there's a, there's a group called NICE, it was started at Sandia, and I, so I've been involved with that about 10 years, and that came out of, and Sandia is where we build our nuclear weapons, and we can't buy, we're not gonna buy a chip, we, every <laughs> nuclear weapon has a control chip, and we can't legally buy those, so we have to make them. So at Sandia, they have, they have a complete Intel fab. They had Intel to come in and build. So they have the kind of fab that would be doing a million Pentiums a week or whatever, and it's doing nothing. Every 10 years, it makes 10,000 chips. And a, a Turkish scientist had the idea, look, why don't we do crazy things with this? Why, why are we let, it, it, it's, it's like the machine that you don't want to turn off. The, it's actually better to keep your fab running than shut it down and try and start it up two years later, nothing will work. So they've started doing these crazy stuff in that Sandia lab. A lot with military chips that can directly smell explosives. Um, very good for the one that's been commercialized is sort of artificial cochlea for for hearing. And the, at the end time, I saw some that were doing smell in very interesting ways. I mean, the the smell is this enormous sort of Hilbert space. Of, so if you have a very simple analog chip, you 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 can get a very elaborate sort of palette of smells that it can sense. Um, Qualcomm is working on one that will, I think, also be marketable that does the speech recognition right sort of pre-processing. So instead of using a whole lot of your phones, uh, and a lot of voice recognition now actually goes out to the cloud and comes back. It's not done right on the, so there's just any, sort of anything you can think of. There's some way of doing it, which is which is sort of what's going to happen. We, we were doing these deep learning networks where we're actually doing it in, in the equivalent of a, you know, of a Neumann supercomputer. But then when you actually solve your problem, like finding cats or something, that, that can actually be a, done on an analog chip for, for enormous, we're talking about thousand-fold decrease in power consumption and stuff like that. So. There's about a half dozen chips out there that do the AI engines at really low cost on a chip that are available if you look for them. Yeah. And the one I've been using recently is by from a company called uh, Kendrite. It's a K210 or 210, and it has on board uh, dual dual Cortex-like cores at 40 megahertz because the digital world for cameras and, and some things you want to do. But it also has FPUs, uh, SH uh, for encryption, um, glass pointing power, uh, uh, floating point ELISON, yeah. FFTs for, for look at so understanding sound and breaking it down into the spectrum. And the one that I think was the neatest part about the chip is the KPU, is the knowledge processing unit, which is a convolutional neural network that's yeah. interfacing. So you can put this other stuff around and you can use that neural network to solve problems. Yeah. And there are little development kits and boards about the size of credit cards that have an LC display on the back side, camera on the front side, and they go for about nineteen dollars. Wow. Yeah, no, it's amazing. So that's, that's how much it's changing. The, the ones I've the things I think just the demos are impressive. The one that was a camera that only like an insect or a frog 
only sees things that move. Yeah, and in this yeah. one, the demo is, is it does face recognition. Yeah. You can have it train it, to, and it's all on board without the external world. You can have it trained to recognize different people's faces. Yeah, so we're, anyway, I think we're going to see that change everything. But quantum computing, I don't know. 